Okay. Welcome to our uh, colloquium today. I'm Pat Clark. I'm standing in for Tom uh, Ryan while he's on vacation uh, to introduce you to our speaker. But let me um, uh, give you a few upcoming events. Uh, I'd like you to join us for the second installment of uh, Lancaster History's new artifact-focused programming series, the Material Culture Forum. Uh, the next one is on Thursday, March 28th. Uh, Lancaster History curatorial staff will lead an in-depth object studies of Lancaster County portraiture and clothing, followed uh, by a presentation by Zara Anishalin. Uh, uh, Dr. Shalin, uh, will, who will also join us in a conversation about her book, Portrait of a Woman in Silk, Hidden Histories of the British Atlantic World. There's a small fee associated with uh, registration for the program and tickets can be purchased on our website or give us a call uh, here at the museum. On Saturday, March 30th, you can visit Wheatland at your own pace. This is a program that we started about a year ago. Uh, it's every last uh, Saturday of the month. Instead of having a tour guide uh, where you're captured in the house at their time, uh, you get to come through the house, go whichever way you want and visit the house and uh, hang around and chit chat with uh, the different interpreters in the rooms. So that's uh, between one and four on March 30th. Our next colloquium uh, will take place on Thursday, April 4, and we will welcome Professor Katie Sibley from St. Joe's University. Uh, she's going to be speaking about surrogate first ladies. Uh, beginning with Martha, Martha Jefferson Randolph, uh, Thomas Jefferson's daughter, there have been a handful of surrogate first ladies who have performed the duties of the White House hostess while not being married to the president. Even when these women are acknowledged as surrogate first ladies, they are often not granted uh, the value or respect of the official first ladies, though many served important roles in presidential administrations. And of course, for most uh, notable to the lineup is our uh, very own Harriet Lane, uh, the niece of President James Buchanan, who was uh, the only woman who was not married to a president that is considered an official first lady by the scholars of first ladies. Harriet Lane acted as Buchanan's hostess and was a highly visible public figure. So now it's my distinct pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Jim Remsen this evening uh, to speak about his new book, Embattled Freedom, uh, rural northeastern Pennsylvania was a bucolic farming region in the 1800s, but political tensions turned below the surface when a group of fugitive slaves settled in the underground railroad village of Waverly near Scranton before the Civil War. They encountered a mix of support from abolitionists and, and animosity from the white supremacists. Once the war came, 13 of Waverly's black black fathers and sons returned south into the bowels of slavery to fight for the Union. Embattled freedom lifts these 13 remarkable lives out of the shadows while also shedding light on the racial politics and social codes they and their people endured in the divided North. The men had found a safe haven in Waverly, but like other people of color in the 1800s and early 1900s, their freedom was uneasy. Their battle for respect never ending. Jim Remsen is a journalist and author of two prior books, The Intermarriage Handbook and Visions of Tioga. Since retiring as religion editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer, Jim has pursued his keen interest in history with a focus on underappreciated aspects of our nation's local histories. Being a native of Waverly, Pennsylvania, he is pleased to be bringing his old hometown's remarkable African-American and Underground Railroad history and heritage to light. Join me in welcoming him. Uh, thank you, Patrick, and uh, thank you for having me here. This is a wonderful center. Um, I was chatting with your librarian, Nathan, earlier, who told me how this really is a product of your community. and the support that uh, you all have given to keep this very uh, vibrant center going. It's amazing. We don't have anything like this down where we are in a much more populous area. Um, 
I come to you from Bala Kinwood. Uh, I think you all probably know Bala Kinwood, Lower Marion. We love our history down there too. Um, it's part of the old Welsh tract, William Penn's original Welsh tract. Uh, and um, we uh, are, are happy to be exploring it there, but we don't have a, a, a lovely uh, institution quite like this there. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about another quadrant of the state, not southeastern PA, but head north from there up to northeastern PA. Like Patrick mentioned, it's where I'm from and where some otherwise um, underappreciated things happened that I wanted to tell folks about. Um, I came to this because I am a native son of up there. I came, uh, went down to Philly for college and then made my career in journalism. Uh, left that, uh, had some other jobs, but also then undertook the, uh, to learn more about the state uh, and through some road trips and some uh, visits to history centers, I dug deeper into some aspects that I um, wished I had learned in school. I don't know if you feel like you really got a deep understanding of your history where you were from, but I learned first about the uh, Native American history uh, up in that neck of the woods and how dramatic and important it was. Didn't know it at all in school and set out to learn more about it and write vis Visions of Tioga a few years ago. And then um, you know, was able to speak to schools and to different uh, history groups about that. Then uh, remembered about this other um, story that lay more or less at my feet, you might say, which was out of Waverly. Uh, growing up there, I was dimly aware that we had this settlement of Negroes on the edge of town. When you know, as a baby boomer, that would be how I would learn a little bit about it, but not any content to it, nothing at all taught in school. So I said, well, I'm going to see what I could learn about that. And as it, with Visions of Tioga, being a journalist, you know, I was trained by some really good journalists in research and in narrative writing and in um, interviewing uh, and dove in and you know I'm not an academic historian but I drew from as best I could from histories from social histories uh, from people around town from church histories county histories local histories and was able to pull out a fairly complete picture of, um, of, of Waverly in this story so I know our time is limited, so let me uh, dive us into that. Yes? Hmm. Let me see if I, uh, there we are, I turned the power off. Do it. Uh, so this, here you are seeing uh, the, 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 the uh, scene of a lot of, of, of uh, embattled freedom. This is downtown Waverly. <laughs> late 1800s that's the way rural towns looked back then uh, Waverly was a um, settled by New England Yankees much of the northern tier of Pennsylvania was settled by New England Yankees under this contested claim that Connecticut had to um, that part of Pennsylvania it's a whole another history that we don't teach uh, and so a lot of Yankees came over as family groups family networks and settled beginning about 1800 once that area had been made safe and surveyed. Um, and the, the township that Waverly was the hub of became like the mother township for a lot of that area north of Scranton. Um, and Waverly itself originally was called Abington Center. It was called Abington. There's a, obviously an Abington near Philly, but there's another one. If you're from up there, you'd be familiar with the other Abington. Abington Center had about 300 people during the mid-1800s, the period that I, I focus on. Um, Lily White, um, and um, it was a, a, the village itself was like a supply hub for um, the people living around there who were farmers, and it was where you'd go to vote, it was where your kids would go for school, it was where um, the churches were as well. Um, so when I say Yankees, we're talking Wasp Yankees, these are not Catholics, these were not um, Quakers, uh, they were um, Baptist, they were Methodists, they were uh, Presbyterian. I didn't know they were Presbyterians, but they were Presbyterians as well. Um, 
I would urge you to see Waverly uh, as a case study for what was happening in Pennsylvania. This could have been around here as well, um, except for not having Quakers up there particularly, but there were abolitionists for sure who were on fire for that cause. Um, so move forward a, a century. Uh, this is two brothers in their house in Waverly in about 18, I mean 1961, 62. I'm the gawky one on the right with my brother. Uh, we are in our front hallway uh, during the centennial of the Civil War, which was a big deal. Many of us probably remember the centennial of the Civil War, a lot of program and a lot of interest in the Civil War. So you, there you see my big brother who is um, Billy Yank and there's me, Johnny Reb, uh, uh, on the right. I show you this not just because it, it, it's a charming picture but because why was I so comfortable being uh, Johnny Reb um, in the North? I don't remember ever reckoning with or having anybody teach me what it meant to be Johnny Reb and what they were fighting for. It was more just brother against brother and you know fighting and bang, bang, bang and bravery and all and not the great moral cause about slavery and slavery's extension. It was a teachable moment and we kind of missed it and I, you know, I, you know, I, I regret that but that was uh, life. So there, there you see a little relic of uh, the old you know, blithe thinking about the Civil War in the uh, 1960s. Um, I also point out that this house, right on the main drag in Waverly, where I grew up, I learned to my delight in this research, was actually originally occupied by one of the main Underground Railroad abolitionist helpers in this story. I had no idea at the time, and that was, that was a thrill beyond thrills to, to learn that, that through this whole, he no doubt welcomed fugitives, took care of them, had meetings with other um, white supporters uh, in this network. Um, so let's talk about the Underground Railroad a little. This is um, an image that could have happened in Waverly. Um, there you see some fugitives being helped as they come off a wagon and a farm lady on the left here is taking them in for protection in their barn or in their house in the winter. Um, could have happened. Um, a few things I would point out, however, um, and scholars will tell you, um, most of the Underground Railroad, the fugitives on the Underground Railroad were traveling solo or in groups. They generally were young men, young fit men, who were fast and were you know, more mobile. Um, there were incidents like this, but um, generally it was not that. Um, also, the backbone of the Underground Railroad was black people helping black people. We heroicize our white role in this, and of course we were part of it, and certainly in a place like Waverly, which originally did not have black folks to step forward, but this was a, a network that pre-existed where um, black churches and black communities were safeguarding um, vulnerable uh, fellow black people and the whites stepped in and became allies and, and part of that but often they are not really held up for their role and often they were the ones who were stepping forward to fight the slave catchers it was not the whites um, just just to say but somewhere between 50 75 thousand individual black people were able to escape uh, um, either on the Underground Railroad or on their own, following their own noses. Um, that's a lot of individuals, but it's uh, when you look at, uh, by the time of the Civil War, there were four million people held in bondage in the South, so we're talking, you know, one, one and a half percent were able to get out. The rest lived lives of anonymity and misery and died uh, in, in the South. Um, so here's another image from that same, that other, that last one was from a book called The Underground Railroad, came out in 1898, written by a man named William Siebert, uh, who lived in Ohio and a lot of, he, he talked to a lot of folks uh, who had been part of the Underground Railroad. You can see how much activity there is on, on the left side. That would be toward Ohio, where there were also a lot of Yankees that settled in Ohio, a lot of activity. 
a lot of traffic across the Ohio River from Kentucky heading north. So he did a lot of his research there. So there, there's a certain you know spin toward Ohio. But here you see where we are, and you can see the red that would indicate you know lines north. And I draw your attention above that there is. Waverly, right up there. Um, one of the few spots mentioned in northeastern Pennsylvania, this village of 300 people, just confirming it was indeed an established uh, a known spot on this route north for fugitives. Um, and I, so that was going on, and there were white supporters and black supporters making this happen. And yet, uh, the other side of this, which is at least as important and even towers over this, is the hostility to this activity happening in the north, obviously in the south loudly, but in the north. Um, th at the time, uh, in the 1830s, uh, we had Jacksonian democracy, Andrew Jackson. One of his tenets, one of their planks, was hostility to abolition and hostility to black rights, very overt. They stood for other things that are, you know, they're known for being populist and fighting the big banks and looking out for the rights of the yeoman farmer, but they also were uh, very hostile to, to abolition and black rights. And they were the ruling uh, powers in uh, that whole stretch of, of northeastern Pennsylvania. They were running uh, and winning elections on a plank of hostility to abolition. And um, so that was the really the overriding reality. There were reformers on the abolition issue who were running and getting trounced in uh, elections up there. So let's not pretend that this was a benevolent, you know, state. Um, it was loaded with uh, with hostile forces, if not slave catchers, folks who would have um, welcomed having slavery uh, continue. Um, abolitionists came as disruptors, you know, to use the term we would use today. They were disruptors and plenty of people supported the status quo instead and were voting that way as well. I want to, a few times here, I want to read you little uh, quotes out of the book. These are not my words. These are just to show you how this is official talk. Um, so in 1838, there was a successful move to deprive black people, black men, um, with a you know, the electorate was male, but black men of uh, the right to vote in Pennsylvania. It had been ambiguous. It hadn't been addressed one way or the other. Uh-uh. No blacks allowed to vote. This uh, was railroaded through in a constitutional convention in 1838. One of the main architects of that was a man from Waverly, lived a few doors up from the house I grew up in. I had no idea about this. He's held up in history as a you know, an illustrious citizen. He actually was a racist who was uh, vehemently against black voting rights, did not know that. Um, so there was a pushback by the black community, please do not do this, when it was being put up to the electorate um, to, um, in, you know, accept, to ratify this uh, package of constitutional amendments. Black community said, no, 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 please do not do that, come to your senses. So this man, Andrew Bedford, and his fellow delegates from that neck of the woods um, took out uh, a statement in the papers saying, quote, the government was made by white men and it must be preserved by white men. Black people are a caste and to confer suffrage on them to give them the right to vote would be political amalgamation against amalgamation in all its monstrous and hideous aspects the instincts of nature rebel. Whether it be social or political, amalgamation is opposed to all the indications of the divine will and all the sensibilities of human nature. I mean, this is hate speech today. We would not allow this. And this was coming from you know, our town fathers and our uh, elected leaders, a man who became a judge, a Supreme Court justice, congressman. You know, I hate to have to say the words, but um, this was what the abolitionists and the black people were facing in their activism up there. Um, so how did the abolitionists manage to pull this off and not get you know, hauled in? Um, well, one of the big issues, a key issue, was religion. 
was the dictates of Christianity. This was a pious population, and um, the, the abolitionists were able to draw on um, scripture for this. Um, this was the last stages of the second great awakening in American history. And some of the preachers had been, you know, out and about with their revivals saying that uh, we had to purify society, that Jesus was coming, and we had to create the right conditions to uplift society. Some of those purifications were getting rid of alcohol. There was a big temperance movement back then. Education, so people could read scripture. Um, it was uh, uh, fighting laziness, indolence, they would have called it, and getting rid of the evil of human slavery, of bondage. That it was a stain on white people who had the hubris, you might say, to think that that was permissible, and also uh, you know, a sin to oppress black people like that. Um, and uh, they were what, if I might throw a little theology in here, they were post-millennial by and large, meaning we know about the end days, the millennium and the end days. There was debate about whether Jesus would come before the thousand year millennium, whether Jesus would come in the middle, whether he would come afterwards. Well, they generally believed he would come afterwards and it was a human task to purify society and lay the conditions for this thousand years of you know, godly life on earth and then Jesus would come and there would be the end of days. So you had a responsibility as a Christian to you know, uh, bring about these, these purifying reforms, including abolition. Um, so oh, let me go back one. Uh, so this fellow on, on the left was one of the main um, Underground Railroad supporters in Waverly. One of the few photos or images of any of them I've been able to find. Uh, he was a Presbyterian. Uh, he was what was called a new school Presbyterian. Uh, there was an old school that more took the I, I'll say conservative. I hesitate to use that word. If you're conservative, don't think I'm saying you're on the wrong side of all of this, but the old line position um, on, um, on um, slavery, that uh, Jesus never fought against slavery. Um, uh, we don't want to disrupt the, the, the status quo in the country. Um, and we didn't have slavery in Pennsylvania anyways, which we did, and, but uh, not much of it. Um, that is him. He would have stood with um, um, you know, the religious reformers uh, very loudly. He would have been an immediatist was the term of the day where we immediately was, must overthrow slavery, nothing gradual about it. This scripture from Deuteronomy on, on the right is one you read if you do research on Underground Railroad. It was very influential, certainly with abolitionists and one they could, they could cite with um, other folks to try to draw them in. You know, I want to take a minute to do a little thought experiment with you. Imagine you are alive in 1850. You're a villager up there reckoning with this. The country was really boiling over, over, over these issues about slavery and the extension of slavery into the Western territories that were being settled. Um, and would they be slave or free? So if you look at all this, you could unpack it. I see it into three rough things that you needed to grapple with. One is how did you feel about the institution of slavery and the overthrow or not of it and abolition? You know, did you believe that um, slavery should be allowed because it was uh, allowed under the Constitution? And in fact, it was a big driver of the national economy. It was our big, biggest export were you know, products of, of slave labor. Cotton was huge. Um, would you want to risk all that? It was driving, you know, work in the, in the uh, factories in the north. Uh, you know, it was very important to the health of the economy if you wanted to just take that kind of narrow look. Um, or did you feel it was such a more repugnant, you know, uh, moral issue that it had to be overthrown? Okay, what kind of abolitionist were you going to be? There were degrees of abolition. Were you going to be a John Brown who took up arms and killed? You know, made it happen uh, that way, be so willing to put your life on the line? Were you going to be an immediatist who would pull out of a church that tolerated slavery, for instance? 
Were you going to take part? There were boycotts. There was a free produce movement. Were you going to be part of that? Uh, or were you going to be more of a, a gradualist? There was this colonization movement, maybe some of you know about, where there was a belief that money could be raised and uh, we supporters could buy the freedom of individual slaves and ship them to a colony and Liberia in Africa was created for that purpose. Um, get them back where they belong with some, even racist abolitionists would, would have said, uh, very unrealistic. Um, only a few thousand ever did that and it would fail anyways, but we're talking again, four million slaves. Were you gonna be uh, like that? Uh, or were you going to be an apologist and you know allow slavery to continue because the founding fathers, in their wisdom, saw it as necessary? Where, so where did you stand on that issue? Also, where did you stand on the issue of the Underground Railroad? Putting aside you know those big issues overriding the national debate in the here and now, in in your threshold, uh, if somebody came at night who was a fugitive, were you going to take him in, or were you going to? turn the other way, look the other way, or were you going to um, take him in or turn him in? You know, where did you stand? And that's where this scripture could have been influential, must have been influential with certainly the abolitionists and would be influential in trying to draw others into the movement saying, you have a duty. I don't know if you've read that. It says, you shall not deliver uh, someone who has escaped he has a right to dwell where he wishes, and you shall not oppress him. You know, very declarative language. You had a, a duty, if you consider yourself a Christian, to take him in. So you may not have wanted him to escape. You may not have helped him escape. If he comes to you and you consider yourself a, a good, uh, pious uh, man of God, you, you must take him in. Would, that may have been how, despite the uh, Jacksonian democ democratic hostility, that uh, Waverly managed to have its settlement continue to grow because of the, the arguments that the uh, abolitionists could have made to sort of neutralize the opposition, keep, it, keep the opponents at bay, so to speak, or even keep some of them involved to some degree or another. And they also could always tell them, oh, and um, they'll be uh, field hands and they could help and we need you know, labor. Um, just a, a kind of an opportunistic uh, way to look at it. But you had to decide what you were going to do about the Underground Railroad or not. You also had to decide how you felt about black people as individuals. There were free blacks, too. You know, how did you feel about black people as neighbors, as fellow congregants in your church, as somebody who could vote, as somebody who could hold office? Um, there were, you know, huge debates about that. And the Jacksonian Democrats were telling you, no, no, no. The natural order of things is we are is white supremacy, um, and so are you going to stand up on that, or are you going to sit? And hate to say, but most people sat on their hands or were uh, opposed. And the Underground Railroad um, active, you know, network was uh, was a small minority up there, even though we may not want to think that. Um, So this lovely gentleman on the right became a Supreme Court uh, justice, chief justice for a while. Uh, he was uh, on the other side of all of these issues. He was from Wilkes-Barre. His name is George Washington Woodward. Um, and he uh, was made the argument that this was God's will, that there was slavery. Uh, that you, here you see a pamphlet on the right. There were what were called pamphlet wars back then by the two sides, the uh, theologians pro and con slavery, uh, the one saying, uh, apologizing for slavery, saying it, it existed in biblical times. Jesus never preached against it. It did exist in biblical times, but I have to point out it generally was not the kind of um, slavery that we saw in the U.S. It was not uh, whole families. It might be an individual caught in battle. It would not be the whole family generally, and it would not be Across generations, it would not be hereditary, uh, and you could buy your way uh, out of uh, slavery. Um, I wanted to read you just quickly a quote from uh, George Washington Woodward. And again, just to have it kind of sink in, uh, the kind of rhetoric that was going out, Woodward termed abolitionists Boston infidels whom Unitarianism has thrown up to the surface 
Their weapons were sometimes gross blasphemies, sometimes literary platitudes, sometimes humanitarian philosophies. But whichever they were, they were directed against slavery, not because they cared for blacks or whites, but because slavery was an institution of civilized and Christianized society. They saw the plain evidence that the principle of human bondage had received divine sanction. This intensified their hate of it. And he goes on in that vein. And again, this man became Pennsylvania Supreme Court Chief Justice during the war and remained an apologist uh, throughout the war. Um, even ran for, um, for governor. Uh, fortunately, was not elected. Uh, <laughs> So uh, just to give you an idea of the political climate that you need to know. Uh, so let me jump back into Waverly. So again, I despite that hostility uh, around, around and even within the village, um, the abolitionists were able to carefully uh, nurture um, a settlement of you know, families that came in. And the families decided to build the settlement. I'll explain that. But this building on the left still exists. It's on the main street in Waverly. And it um, was where, in the 1830s and 40s, probably more in the early 40s, the first fugitives that came in were given uh, lessons in reading and writing for the children and also for the adults, which was remarkable. I mean, the fugitives knew that would be a key to, to success in their lives. And they had been denied the right to read and write in the South. So um, the um, some of the white villagers stepped forward and shared their school books and gave them lessons in reading and writing in that building. Uh, it also was where uh, the, the fugitive uh, families would have their early worship services until uh, there were enough of them and they had the wherewithal and the support from some of the white churches around to build their own little AME church, African Methodist Episcopal Church on the hilltop right on the edge of town. Uh, which is what became called Colored Hill at the time, and it was where it was the hub of the black settlement. And that on, on the right is a photo. Uh, it's now been uh, absorbed into a larger family home that's up there, but that is the frame of the little AME church uh, in its closing days in the 1920s. It was built in uh, 1856. Um, so the um, the, the black families sunk roots. They were given tracts of land by one of the landowners there. They got jobs uh, in the farms and the, you know, the barns and in the fields and the women being uh, washerwomen or um, you know, helping in the homes. Um, and the children, remarkably, from the beginning were accepted into the schools, um, which was no sure thing. There were plenty of uh, towns that would not allow blacks in their schools schools at all, um, or uh, would have segregated schools. And that was not the case uh, in Waverly, to its great credit. Uh, and this continued even through the 1850s, which was a very scary time with the Fugitive Slave Act. There are a few incidents of slave catchers coming into town and being driven away, probably again by the, the black men with uh, pistols, some account of them having pistols and um, you know, pitchforks and other ways to um, chase them away. So things kept heating up in the country, um, and we finally uh, had our civil war. Uh, it came to such a boil. Uh, Lincoln was elected. Um, the South uh, freaked at that and, um, and seceded, uh, making slavery uh, the cause of it all. They said that it, right in their constitution, this is about uh, upholding and spreading slavery. And don't doubt that. The state's rights is about the right to expand slavery and institute slavery. So uh, in Northeastern PA and certainly everywhere else, including here, there were plenty of loyal uh, boys and men who stepped forward to serve uh, in the Union Army and you know, be loyal to, to Lincoln and put down uh, the rebellion. Um, there also was plenty of opposition. You can see um, this is one of the many, uh, every courthouse in the state has a statue like that. Uh, I was at the Confederate um, Museum in Richmond and noticed this uh, deserter poster, which is from the Congressional District where in Northeastern PA, and it's a list of, of deserters. Uh, there was plenty of um, 
desertion, plenty of, uh, you might say treason, that was um, uh, being fomented by Democratic officials uh, encouraging men to uh, be draft dodgers. It was something even uh, the, the other side was saying, it was like a new underground railroad now. They used to, uh, they, you know, the opponents of uh, abolition used to hate the underground railroad. Now they want their own underground railroad to get their boys off into the woods to, to hide. Um, I read one scholar who talked about Pennsylvania's inner civil war. Um, and it certainly was the case up in northeastern PA. And so the black people just had to sit on the sidelines and watch this and watch this, you know, and feel this abuse until we get to the middle of the war and uh, the Emancipation Proclamation declared beginning as well in the fall of 62, but it took effect uh, in the beginning of 63. And on the heels of that came uh, a bill to get um, give black men the right to be in service. Um, originally to be in support roles, fatigue duty, you might say, behind the lines, but then pretty quickly to also let them take up arms and join the armed forces. Um, and 13 of the men from Waverly were part of that. Um, Pennsylvania didn't want to have a colored regiment, uh, so they, um, they, they became part of the U.S. They were federalized as U.S. colored troops. Um, and they were trained in uh, right outside Philly, Camp William Penn in Cheltenham, currently Cheltenham. I want to talk a bit about that, this picture on, on the left. You may recognize it. It's from the cover of my book, but uh, it was not made for my book. It's actually a, an original poster, uh, recruiting poster from 1863 um, under the auspices of the Union League in Philadelphia, which is a, existed to support the Union cause and Lincoln and the black troops and trained the white officers who, uh, the, the deal was that they had to be led by white officers. Um, by the end of the war, there were uh, 185,000 black men in the Union Army. I had no idea. I had no idea, I think, going into this or even was, I guess I did from the movie Glory in the 1980s, I guess that came out, but I did not know the number was that vast. And again, I say uh, the 13 from uh, Waverly were among them. So. This is a Union League recruitment poster. I'm told it would have been circulated north and south, and notice it has very few words on it, probably because most of the uh, black men would not have been able to read and write, or certainly a large portion of them. It says freedom to the slave and the banner on the flag, but that's it. It conveys its story in very powerful imagery that would have been familiar. Um, I think of this as a Moses and the promised land, you might say, that that handsome black man in the middle is saying, come with me, I'll lead you to our promised land. And on, on the right, you see the before imagery. This is what we must go through, our, you know, our narrow place, our Mitzrayim in, you know, in, in Hebrew, uh, to get to um, freedom. We will fight, we will uh, free slaves. You see that black soldier in, on the right there? He's actually taking the shackles off the wrists of a, of a slave huddled in the, in the shadows there. Um, and the men going into battle and falling you know, in the rear. And over on the left is the promise, you might say. There you see this man taking his leisure in a rocking chair, putting down the plow, reading a newspaper. Beautiful images. You see that there's a child at the soldier's feet at feet there who, who's in a dress, not in rags like the, the ones on, on the right, and a, a, a cluster of children running off to school, black boys and girls running off to school, a brick public school, all under the protection of the flag, of the American flag. So uh, a, a beautiful um, poster, and again, um, 185,000 people, most, most of them black men in the South. Kentucky had the largest number who, who turned out, um, fought in the Union cause. Um, so meanwhile, the, the, the other side, the Jacksonian Democrat, the Democrats um, kept up their fight uh, against all of this. I could read you more ugly quotes about uh, black abolitionism and uh, N-words and, you know, all in print, all 
said by congressmen and you know and elected officials. Um, and so there's an image from Harper's Weekly of Columbia. That's the, the figure of, of America uh, being swarmed by these copperheads. You've probably all heard of copperheads. Snakes that, poisonous snakes that strike without warning. So you know, I was stunned when I went into the newspapers of the day up in the Scranton area and found the rallies being held against Lincoln and the rallies being held against the draft and draft riots. There were deaths and draft riots and right outside of Scranton. I had no idea. This is not taught. 1864 election, Lincoln lost that county up there. Um, so this, you know, this this kept up throughout and the, the black soldiers went off to war with this invective, you know, ringing in their ears. Um, so they were trained, as I said, uh, the, the Waverly men were trained to Camp William Penn. So I want to focus uh, briefly on two of the regiments, the, the 3rd U.S. Colored Troops, 3rd Regiment, and the 22nd Regiment. The 3rd, this, this shows images of the 3rd. Um, they went down to uh, Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, where the, the 54th Massachusetts, which was this pilot, this pioneering uh, black regiment had fought in uh, this battle of Fort Wagner that was depicted in the movie Glory. And the battle continued. The, the 54th was repulsed with horrible losses that day. They stayed down there, but reinforcements were brought in, including the third. And they continued the, the push, uh, the assault on Wagner you know, for, for months until finally the, the, uh, the Confederates abandoned the fort. It was a strategic defense fort that was guarding the, this uh, harbor, uh, the Charleston Harbor. This image, again from Harper's Weekly, shows the black troops of the 3rd um, and other, there were, there's another black regiment down there, digging this zigzag trench up toward Fort Wagner, toward, toward the, um, the fortifications of Wagner. Um, it looks kind of like eh, you're a day at the beach. Actually, they were doing this at night under fire cannon fire, sharpshooter fire, taking losses. There were torpedoes, there were booby traps in the sand. People were blowing up. Um, they did it. They kept pressing forward. And uh, ultimately, um, they succeeded. And Wagner was taken by the North. I want to read you one more quick quote in here. from. Um, it's a lovely quote from one of the men of, of the 3rd of this regiment. Uh, he was a, a freeborn sailor from Philadelphia who then was in the third. He, he expressed hope after this had happened that his black comrades got due credit for their part in the fort's capture. His name was Harmon, Henry Harmon. He wrote a letter from this place, Morris Island, telling how his men with spades and shovels dug up to the very parapet of the rebel fort under a heavy fire of grape and canister shell from rebel batteries. In those trenches, our men um, distinguished themselves for bravery and coolness, which required more nerve than the exciting bayonet charge. When you hear of a white family that has lost father, husband, or brother, you can say of the colored man that we too have borne our share of the burden. We too have suffered and died in defense of that starry banner which floats over free men. A lovely uh, and true sentiment that we white people needed to hear. Um, so that's the third. Let me jump to the regiment that had six at half of Waverly's men. It was the 22nd. They went down to Petersburg, this bloody and protracted siege of Petersburg. Um, had some earlier engagements, but then uh, the day of June 15th was the Union launching their frontal assault on the defense lines around Petersburg before things bogged down into the siege. It was an attempt to overrun and you know not have the siege. Um, they were there in the spear point. They were out and, and um, running right up into the uh, rebel cannon batteries and um, you know the, the, the men in, in the trenches firing right into their faces uh, took losses that day overran one of the uh, cannon batteries that image from the top again from um, Harper's Weekly shows 
them parading with one of the, the cannons that they captured while in the back. You may not be able to make it out, but it's uh, there are white soldiers who witnessed all this and cheered them for their accomplishment, which was you know remarkable. White soldiers, many of them anyways, were racist who did not want to have black comrades in arms and needed a lot of convincing. Others were, this, this group happened to be from Ohio, and I think they probably were more amenable to, uh, to having black comrades. They, they were cheering for their uh, success that day. Uh, that happened at dawn, and the fighting continued until dusk. It was a marathon day of battle at Petersburg. And so the 22nd hunkered down in the middle of the day, caught in a crossfire, and then the line broke. They surged forward, went up the hill again. This was more at the center of the, of the this top one was an outpost that they overran. This was the, the, the part of the line. And they charged up and they took a battery and then they took another battery while sustaining losses as well. You see that bottom image, postage stamp. This is, a, there was a painting made called The Assault, The Charge of the 22nd, um, and done in the 1890s by a, a painter. And it was selected by the, U, the Postal Service as one of the commemorative stamps during the sesquicentennial a few years ago, which was wonderful. So my guys, I can't help but think of these as my guys were on a postage stamp that you can, you can get. Uh, the 22nd charging uphill, um, a remarkable day. And you can see some of these quotes here were uh, people, you know, exultant uh, over that day. Um, and the, the, the general in charge of the Union assault sought out the black soldiers the next day, visited them in the field, and praised them for their, their gallantry. Um, you can see this bottom quote by a chaplain for the, one of the black regiments saying, this is a day long to be remembered by the entire colored race in this continent. The day when prejudice died in the entire uh, army of the U.S. America, which was a nice thought, but uh, we know that uh, is wishful thinking. But still, a red letter day. I had no idea about this. This was a thrill, and I've been able to you know, bring this to the uh, people up, up there and have actually made touch, made contact with some of the descendants of the fugitives and shared this with them. So again, the 22nd, they stay in the field um, fighting in several other battles. Um, when Richmond finally falls, they are among the first troops to go into the city to help put out the fires that the Confederates set to, you know, towards their own, their own capital. Um, and a week later, Lincoln is killed. Uh, and General Grant, um, in arranging the procession, taking Lincoln's funeral cortege, which is what you're seeing right here, uh, up Pennsylvania Avenue from the White House to the Capitol. He says, get me a good black uh, delegation uh, to come and represent the, the colored troops. And the 22nd is chosen. And the company that has the Waverly men is, the, is there, I know from doing some research, which was wonderful. Uh, and they are pulled out of the trenches and hustled into Washington and actually taken to the head of the line. They lead the national procession to the Capitol, um, which is amazing. And then they are pulled out of that and sent back down to the swamps of Maryland and Virginia to join the hunt for John Wilkes Booth. Uh, so they are in the center of history. Uh, and again, I knew none of this, uh, nor did you know, anybody up there, because nobody had really looked into it. Uh, so the war ends, soldiers trickle home, including the, the men uh, to Colored Hill. Um, Waverly, a few years later, gets a, a, a veteran's post, the GAR, Grand Army of the Republic. Waverly had a post. This is their book on the bottom. And there were, the black men were accepted uh, into that as among the founding members of that post were a couple of the the men of um, of an otherwise you know white post, uh, a lot of the posts were not um, integrated. They were deliberately segregated, um, but not the one in Waverly. The, that post-war period was sort of the golden age of harmony, you might say, in Waverly, uh, the best I can tell. And you know this is one of the indications of that. But the children were thriving in the schools, and the black church would put on an outdoor revival every summer and uh, black churches would send folks 
to share in that, but also the white churches as well would come. And it was a big, um, exuberant uh, you know, weekend of, of services. It was a, a real tradition. And not anything you could count on back in those days when you know Jim Crow was uh, embedded in the South and lynching was happening. Um, but Waverly had its, uh, its interracial revivals. This picture on the right is uh, down in Scranton. They had a big GAR post as well. And that man on the far right is the only photo that I found of any of the 13 black soldiers from Waverly. It was George Keyes, who was one of the sons of one of the, the fugitives. Um, that's George Keyes, uh, with being one of the standard bearers for the um, ceremonies for that place. You can see it, maybe you can read it. The other two men, it tells you a little about them, how old they are. All they tell you about George is he's colored. I don't know if that's uh, disparaging or saying we're proud of that, but it's unusual that that's all they bother telling you about George. He died uh, in his 50s, uh, didn't last much, much after that picture, I do believe. Um, I'm going to, you know, wind it up here, I, just interest of time. Uh, so the Colored Hill Settlement faded away in sort of a natural way. There was no great dramatic difficult ending. Uh, older folks died off. Younger folks wanting more opportunity. Scranton was becoming a boom town. Um, people were going to Scranton, for instance. Others were going other cities as well. Um, these are two examples of the Waverly folks going to Scranton and making good. The lady on the right uh, came up as a fugitive uh, into, into Waverly, um, went down to Scranton with her husband, started a grocery store. He died. She took over. She became a merchant, a fugitive, then becoming a successful merchant in, in Waverly uh, in a, as a woman, not a normal thing for the day to her credit. She helped found the AME church in, in uh, Scranton as well. Um, Mary, Mary Jane Merrick was her name. And then this larger picture here shows that the building in the back is the, the uh, office and headquarters of a, a draying company. Draying was like where, hauling and warehousing back in the day. Um, one of the black boys who became a man from uh, a son of a fugitive uh, raised in Waverly in the church, in the schools there, I mean. Um, then went to um, Scranton to seek his fortune, became a very successful drayman. His name was George Brown, which you could see painted at the top of the building. And this is his crew, uh, which then later became trucks. But um, they did a lot of hauling. They were right across from the uh, Lackawanna Avenue, across from the uh, roundhouse and the, you know, the rail yards there. Um, but the, um, the settlement and basically petered out in uh, Waverly. The church closed up in the 20s. Um, and you know that was the demise of Colored Hill. And here you see what happened pretty much immediately afterwards um, was um, the Klan having its 1920s resurgence and including right up there as well. And you, know, you get a sense that Waverly kind of lost its sense of its own history. That's over the... the um, High school had minstrel shows. The men's club in town put on minstrel shows. Uh, you know, derogatory talk and, in, and images about black people. When the civil rights era came, when we were young, no particular sense that we had a obligation due to our legacy to be involved in that uh, as a boy up there. Um, but um, there's become more interest in the last 10 or 15 years. There's now a marker up at the town a cemetery about this and more interest uh, in it. This is uh, now the, the black uh, uh, headstones up there the, for the soldiers all have their GAR markers and they're honored at ceremonies. The town, this is the end. Um, the town has, uh, has a walking and driving tour if you're up there, you may enjoy that. Um, I've been happy to be a part of uh, giving them solid information for that. Uh, it points out Underground Railroad sites and the black community sites as well. Um, this is my, I was able to get a grant from a community foundation to set up for this website that's on the right to try to get it into schools so they under, have a you know, more rounded understanding of this era uh, in, in Pennsylvania and up there. Um, I invite you to go there, it's free, it's for all of us. Uh, it's got 
segments that draw out some of the themes that you see on the bottom. And I have a blog uh, where you can catch up. It's, it's posted there. I also send it to about 500 people every month. If you want to sign up, there's a sign up out there about history tidbits that I'm continuing to learn. Uh, and I'm happy to um, uh, send it out to you as well. So that is the amazing story of what was sitting under a rock up in Waverly to be learned and has a lot of lessons, I think, for all of us about black history is white history and black bravery was often in the face of our crazy attitudes at the, at the time that I like to think are fading away, but who knows? Um, but um, this is stuff that I think we need to know and need to uh, teach our kids to have a better understanding of, of all of this. And um, I thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, as well. So if you want to raise